Cordy. We'll have lunch. At, thank you. Yes, the most important announcement that I forgot. Well, next week we will have lunch available for uh, individuals who want to take that after the seminar and go outside. Okay. <laughs> thank you, David. Yes. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. It's Lucy Gao, who is currently an assistant professor of statistics and actuarial science at the University of Waterloo in Canada. So she graduated from the University of Washington in 2020 with a PhD in biostatistics, working with Dr. Daniela Witten. And she's won, she won numerous, I'll say two student papers, two back-to-back -back years for the, from the American Statistical Association when she was a student. Um, one of the papers, our clusterings of multiple data views independent was published in biostatistics. And she got the award from the biometrics section. And then she, the next year got testing, uh, the paper now published in biometrics is testing for association in multi-view network data. And that one was presented by the statistical learning and data science section. Um, and she, with that, she has software package available on CRAN called multi-view test. So she is a candidate um, for our faculty position in data science. And today her talk is titled Valid Inference After Hierarchical Clustering. So welcome Lucy, and thank you for speaking today. Great. Hi everyone. Thank you again for the very kind introduction. Um, I've had a great time virtually visiting you all today. Both, um, I'm excited to both get to share my work with such a wonderful group and to get to meet and chat with more faculty later today. So to set this, the stage for my talk today, um, in the last few day, years, um, I've been working on problems that I broadly think of as falling under the umbrella of double dipping. So what on earth is double dipping? Um, as a colloquial phrase, I looked it up and I think it was popularized by the 90s sitcom Seinfeld, where this double dipping idea means dipping a chip into a bowl of dip, taking a bite and then doing another dip. On the other hand, in the scientific community, the term double dipping has come to mean something perhaps more data centric. And throughout this talk, double dipping is going to mean first looking at your data in order to pick some kind of a null hypothesis to test, and then going ahead and testing that same null, that null hypothesis that you picked on the exact same data set. So perhaps that's a little abstract. So to make this idea a little bit more concrete, we can think about like, you know, one of the first hypotheses that we learn about in statistics. So this is like the null hypothesis that two groups have the same mean. Now there are lots of classical stats 101 tests for doing this. So you can think of something like the t-test. Um, and those tests are designed to have nice reassuring statistical properties like type one error rate control when the groups are defined before we see the data. Well, then you might ask, well, what if instead of defining the groups before we see the data, we see, define these groups after we see the data? Then we're double dipping, right? We're looking at the data in order to define the groups, which are appearing in our null hypothesis. And then we're using that exact same data set to test it. And to put things very mildly, conventional statistical wisdom says that this is a super bad idea. This is like a classic data analysis pitfall that you'll be warned off of as early as, you know, like your first intro to applied stat class. And it's considered very bad because, you know, really any guarantee you might have about how classical tests might behave, they just go straight out the window in the double dipping setting. They don't really apply. All right, so, you know, we've all been told don't define groups for hypothesis testing after you see the data. Um, that seems kind of easy, right? Well, I'm going to argue today that it's not always so easy to do that in practice. So let's think about a simple task like clustering. So this is like the idea of dividing um, your observations into similar looking groups. So let's say you have some data. Um, I'll put up like a very simple data set up here. Like this is like 100 observations on two features. And then imagine writing your favorite clustering algorithm on them. Um, I've just chosen hierarchical clustering for the slide here. And then once you've done that, you get some estimated clusters from your data, which I've displayed using the different colors like blue, orange, and green on the right. Well, now that I've done this analysis, I'm looking at this picture that I've created. And like, if you look at the different colored observations, they for sure look kind of different. And in fact, if you took the sample means for each color, you would get these vectors that don't 
don't look so close either. So I think it's a very natural next step to wonder if this observation from our data really extends to the population means. And suddenly you've just gotten yourself into the situation where testing for a difference in means between the clusters, which again is double dipping, actually feels like a very natural thing to do. And in fact, this is a pretty, this is really like a very common thing to do in single cell RNA sequencing studies, where in their context, they have data with cells on the rows and genes on the columns. And they're clustering the cells to get what they're hoping are cell subtypes, like something like a T cell or a B cell. Then they're testing for a difference in mean gene expression levels across the different clusters. And I'll talk more about this application later when we can get to the real data, but the point is for better or for worse, testing for a difference in means after clustering is being done out there in the wild, even though, you know, like your statistics textbooks will say not to do it. All right, um, so we have that, but how bad of a problem really is double dipping and clustering? You know, if you take a pragmatic point of view, even if it, even if it's theoretically wrong, if, if in practice it, is, it, it isn't so bad, maybe we shouldn't be so worried about doing it. So this slide I'm going to find out with um, just kind of like a little um, small simulated example. So on this slide, um, what I've done is I have sampled 100 observations from like this pure noise model without any signal whatsoever. So to be specific, um, each of these 100 plotted data points I drew from a standard bivariate normal distribution. So that means that no matter how I group these observations, those groups will have no difference whatsoever in their population means. I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to go ahead and cluster the observations. And once again, I'm just going to display the estimated clusters using colors. Once again, even though I know because I simulated this data because I've just clustered pure noise, you can see that the different estimated clusters do look kind of clustery. And then finally, I'm going to test the mean of the green cluster against the mean of the orange cluster, and then the mean of the green against the blue and the blue against the orange. And to do that, um, I am going to do something pretty simple. I'm just going to calculate the pairwise distances between the sample means of the clusters. And you can calculate corresponding p-values using like a corresponding classical statistical test. And that will get you three p-values for the three different pairs of clusters. And if you look at these three p-values, they are all just like absurdly tiny. So the point is, in this example, if I had really gone through this double dipping process of clustering and then testing for a difference in means, I would have just like cheerfully without a care in the world, just rejected the null hypothesis of no difference in means with absolute blinding confidence. Even though I know in my heart because I simulated this data, there can't be any real differences in means here. All of the observations are normal zero one. There can't possibly be any difference in population means between these groups. So at least in the case of clustering, double dipping really is a problem. It really can lead to like atrociously bad inference. <clears throat> All right, so naively double dipping uh, appears to be a terrible idea, but you might be thinking perhaps it, there's a pretty easy fix because like in, very often in this type of statistical problem, splitting your observations into two separate independent data sets, one for choosing a, a hypothesis and one for testing it, it tends to, this tends to be kind of like a silver bullet solution. It tends to fix things very, very well. So now in this setting, let's try and fix our clustering problem with sample splitting. So I think the natural way about doing a, of like going about this is um, I would have taken my like same signal as normal zero one data from before. And this time I would send about half of those data points to become a training set and the rest to become a test set. And the purpose of doing this is now this time, instead of clustering the whole data set, I can just cluster the observations in the training set. And again, as a reminder, I've reserved out this totally independent data set for at least nominally the sole purpose of hypothesis testing. How am I going to use it to test the hypothesis of a difference in means between clusters? Well, in order to do that, I need to somehow transport these clusters I have on the training set to the test set. I'm sure there are any number of ways of doing this. Um, I think the details aren't super relevant, but just for the sake of like doing something concrete, um, I did something very simple. I just used three nearest neighbors classification. The idea is like for a given observation in the test set, I look in the training set for the closest three points. 
And if most of them are orange, then I'll just color that test observation orange. And you can see by doing this, you can divide the test set into two groups. So, all right, um, now I kind of figure that I've been good this time. I've gotten clusters from totally independent training data. And I might think that I can safely test the null hypothesis of no difference in means between the orange and green observations on the test data. But as you can see from this slide, somehow something has once again gone terribly wrong because my p-value is still like 10 to the minus five. Um, that's a little bit larger, but it's still like super tiny. And I want to emphasize that this is kind of an unintuitive result. In fact, when I first got this result, I was still a PhD student. I showed this to my advisor. And her first reaction was tell me to, to like tell me to check my code for bugs. <laughs> Cause you know, sample splitting might not always be the best solution, but in almost every other scenario I've heard of, it, it, it is some kind of a solution. So what on earth is the issue here? Well, I thought about it a bit and it turned out to be actually pretty sneaky. Um, and in a nutshell, it's really just that like, in this case, sample splitting doesn't successfully avoid double dipping. The reason for that is this third step where you have to somehow port the training set clusters to the test set. There's really no way to do that without looking at the test data in order to divide the test observations into groups. So that null hypothesis that there's no difference in means between green and orange on the test set, that actually was chosen after looking at the test data. So even though you didn't literally run a clustering algorithm on the test set, when you go through this process, you're still double dipping. In the third step, you're choosing a null hypothesis to test somehow using the test data. And in step four, you're testing it. So the take home here is that um, unfortunately, clustering is just kind of like this rare case where sample splitting doesn't provide any kind of like a get out of jail free card. And just to prove to you that I haven't somehow picked like some kind of like a super pathological data set, I have on the slide p-values using the, the naive approach where um, we're clustering and testing using all of our data, plotted against quantiles with a uniform zero one distribution. So the point of this is that we expect p-values to be uniformly distributed under the null. That's how we get control of the type one error rate. If these double dip p-values were uniformly distributed, you would expect these black dots to fall on the diagonal line. You can see that's not really the case. Um, they're, instead, they're forming kind of like this weird swoopy-ish line at the bottom. So what that means is that these double dip p-values, they're definitely not uniformly distributed. And that turns out to be very, very bad for us in this particular simulation study, because if you run the numbers, then it turns out that um, in this simulation study, we're actually incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis 97% of the time, even though our tests have a nominal level of 5%. So honestly, that's just, that, that's pretty horrific. So, so now I want to ask, like, why are these naive p-values so bad? I mean, like, yeah, yeah, double dipping, but what is it exactly that goes wrong? Well, as a reminder, clustering the data to pick our groups, that means that we're choosing the groups after we're looking at the data. Another way to word this is that, well, the null hypothesis that we're interested in testing, it really is like a function of the data. And this is just like fundamentally not how classical hypothesis tests are supposed to work. Kind of like everything about how they're designed assumes that the hypothesis is totally independent of the data. Now, if we make the hypothesis a function of the data, it's no longer independent of our data, and we risk being just like wildly optimistic. Or to put it more plainly, we're going to reject the null hypothesis too often. So with that in mind, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to be introducing a new hypothesis testing framework that fixes double dipping by properly accounting for the fact that the null hypothesis is a function of the data. So that brings us back to our main question in this talk. Again, we want to be able to cluster our data and then ask if there's a difference in the population cluster means without wildly inflating the type one error rate. 
And next, I'm going to start by making some of these ideas I talked about in the intro more like mathematically concrete. And then I'm going to propose a solution based on conditioning. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to write down some kind of uh, statistical framework. So that lets me make my question on the last slide actually precise. So I'm going to assume that I'm observing data. Um, I'm calling little x in my notation. It's an m by q matrix. I'm assuming that each row is drawn from a q-dimensional normal distribution, where the distribution for each row gets its own population mean parameter mu i, but the same covariance parameter sigma squared times the identity. We assume that sigma squared is known. I'll note here that the spherical structure of the covariance matrix, that's not like especially important. Um, if you wanted to put a put like some kind of like a full P by P matrix um, there, then that would be no problem. And in fact, that's what I'll do later in the application. Here, I'm mostly assuming sigma squared times the identity to simplify the presentation. So now I'm going to cluster my observed data little x to get k clusters. So I've defined some notation here. Um, so like c at one are the indices of the rows that are part of the first cluster. And c at two are the indices of the rows that are part of the second clusters and so on and so forth. For each of these estimated clusters, I'm associating like a population mean parameter. Um, I'm calling it mu bar c at k. So this is just like taking all of the observations um, that are part of C at K, and I'm just going to go ahead and average their population new parameters. And now um, we can finally make a question of whether two clusters have different population means, um, very precise. We just want to test the null hypothesis that their new bars are equal. Now um, we have this on this page now, and we can kind of see that this hypothesis is at least a little unsettling. If you don't look at it too closely, it does sort of look like a standard null hypothesis about population parameters, since it does involve these mu's which come from our data generating mechanism. On the other hand, if you look a little bit closer, you realize that it also involves the data itself somehow, right? Because we're averaging the mu's over C hat k's, which are cluster assignments estimated from the data. So again, we've hit kind of like this unsettling point where the null hypothesis we want to test is a function of the data which we're not too sure how to deal with. Well, one approach is just to sort of like ignore that problem and just like pretend that the null hypothesis is pre-specified. So the CIAT case do not depend on the data. And that leads to like the, what I call the naive approach in my intro slides, um, which basically just asks like, what's the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a large difference between the cluster means in the data if there really were no difference in the population cluster means. And because we assumed like a normal probability model for the data, we do actually know the precise distribution of this test statistic. Um, it's just like a sum of standard squared like standard normals, which is a chi-squared distribution. So the point is this p-value is super easy to compute. But as we saw, this p-value also doesn't control the type one error rate. How can you see this from the slide? Well, one way of looking at it, um, I like thinking about the p-value is like asking if the observed data is unusual, given that the pre-specified null hypothesis is true. But if you are actually allowed to pick this null hypothesis using your data, then I think your definition of unusual should probably be a little bit different. Because we cluster the data in order to get CIK and CIK prime, we should never see a small difference between the sample means of CIK and CIK prime, basically just because if there was a small difference, then the clustering algorithm probably wouldn't have called them different clusters. So fundamentally, this naive p-value is basically just being calculated with the wrong null distribution. So what should we be doing instead? Well, an elegant solution is to basically just like ask a different question in a way that kind of leads to a sensible definition of what's unusual. Instead of asking what's the probability under the null seeing such a large difference between C at K and C at K prime in my data, I'm asking that question given the fact that clustering my data gave me C at K and C at K prime in the first place. So this leads to a p-value. Um, I have like an interpretation in writing. 
Um, but like, just like verbally, um, it's the, the, it's the idea of I'm asking the same question, but I'm limiting myself to the universe of data sets that would have given me CIK and CIK prime. Precisely because if clustering my data hadn't given me those clusters, I would never in a million years have thought to test this particular null hypothesis. And this basically makes it so that um, I'm only calling the difference in means I observed large, um, if it's large compared to data sets in which these clusters actually look different enough so that I actually estimate them as clusters, which kind of intuitively fixes this overly optimistic behavior of the naive test. And this p-value I have on the, on the slide, it has a nice property, which is that it controls the selective type one error rate. So this is a probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, given that it is actually true, but also that we actually decided to test it after looking at our data. So really you can see that the difference between this and like, you know, like regular type one error rate from stats 101 is this first bullet point. All right, um, that's well and good, but uh, I have found out the hard way that just because I can write down some kind of a probability expression doesn't mean that I actually know how to calculate it. And in this case, the reason why I don't know how to calculate what's up on the top of the slide is I don't know how to calculate the set of x's that satisfy the conditioning event on this right hand side. I don't think this is overly surprising. If I knew how to calculate the conditioning set, that would mean that I knew how to enumerate like the entire universe of data sets that would have given me these two clusters. Um, I don't, I just don't really know how to deal with that. There's like a ton of moving parts and there's also like a bunch of unknown parameters under the null. So instead we're going to use um, what I think is like a very clever idea that was first proposed in like a different context, the context of inference after variable selection in regression. And this idea is basically to condition on like a very carefully chosen bit of additional information. And the magic part about this is it's going to turn out that if I very carefully pick the additional stuff that I can condition on, then I can make this p-value into something I can figure out how to compute. And what's more, by doing that, I don't have to give up my selective type one error rate control. So basically, as long as I'm clever about what I put in this like more category on the slide, then I can get a p-value that not only behaves properly, but that I can actually calculate. All right, um, so what is this additional stuff that I should be conditioning on? Um, the answer is on the slide. Um, roughly speaking, I'm conditioning on a bunch of linear algebra. My p-value is the probability of seeing such a large difference in cluster means, um, given that clustering the data gave me those clusters, um, and then like the direction of the vector containing the differences in the sample means and um, the subspace orthogonal to the contrast coefficient vector that defines the difference in means. And um, yeah, that, that, that is a mouthful. Um, what on earth does it mean? Well, even though perhaps it sounds like I just rattled off like a random jumble of linear algebra, there is actually like an easy to understand interpretation that I can basically draw for you in a picture. Just like try and hold on to that thought for two slides. Um, I will be coming back to it. So again, just like holding off on what this extra stuff we're conditioning on is for a moment, let's first see what it buys us. And the important thing that this extra conditioning buys us is basically this result on the slide. This new p-value I've written down with all like this extra conditioning stuff, I can actually rewrite it as the probability that this random variable phi is larger than some threshold, given that clustering some kind of like an n by q data set formed by using both my observed data, little x and phi, gives me c at k and c at k prime, which were the clusters I got in my original data. All right, so what is this x prime of phi thing? Um, it turns out that it's just a perturbation of my original data, where if like the ith row belongs to c at k, I'm adding some kind of a constant to xi. Um, if the ith row belongs to c at k prime, then I'm subtracting a constant. Um, if it doesn't belong to either of those estimated clusters, I'm just taking x prime of phi i to be the same as xi. But once again, um, I, the math was up there, but it's much easier to understand in a picture. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. So first of all, I have up here, like a picture of my original data, little x. I'm going to call the blue cluster C at K 
and the orange cluster CIK prime. And I've kind of just like drawn like a dashed line through the blue and orange cluster sample means um, in this original data set little x. Then on the right, I'm showing you um, like an x prime of phi for a very large value of phi. And what happens here is, as you can kind of like just see, x prime of phi, what is it doing? It's really just like pulling CIK and CIK prime like apart along the, the axis of this dashed line while keeping that purple cluster, which isn't involved in the null hypothesis, exactly where it is. So you can kind of see just by looking at this that x prime of phi for a large value of phi, it really is just a perturbation of the original data set little x that is holding everything except for the two clusters of interest fixed um, while exaggerating the difference between the two clusters of interest. What about when we plug in like a really small value of phi? Well, in that case, then x prime of phi is doing the opposite. Um, it's still keeping that like purple cluster that wasn't involved in the null hypothesis fixed, but this time it's taking those two clusters of interest, like the blue and orange observations, and now it's pushing them towards each other, um, again, along the axis of, the, of that dashed line. And if it, it turns out that a phi is exactly equal to the distance between the blue and orange centroids in the original data, then um, x prime of phi is kind of just doing nothing. It is literally like an exact copy of x. So the point here is x prime of phi is really just taking my original data and it's either pulling apart or pushing together the two clusters of interest while leaving everything else the same, um, where really like whether you're choosing to push or pull and the extent that you're doing this pushing or pulling, those depend on the value of phi. All right, so um, a lot happened in the last couple of slides. So just to summarize, remember we defined this p-value that conditioned on like um, kind of like extra linear algebra stuff. And what it turned out to be is just like a p-value that amounts to calculating the conditional probability involving some kind of a univariate random phi. So now it's the same words. Well, this p-value is really asking the question, out of all data sets of the form x prime of phi, that would give me CIK and CIK prime if I ran my clustering algorithm. Among those data set, what's the probability of seeing such a large difference in the sample means of CIK and CIK prime under the null? So finally, I think we're equipped to understand what was so clever about all that extra like linear algebra conditioning. Because what that conditioning turns out to have meant is it's basically just like saying, let's condition on the universe of data sets that I could have gotten just by pulling CIK and CIK prime apart or by smooshing them together in my original data, which is just like a much more manage manageable to like think about and work with than like the whole universe of all data sets that could have possibly given me these two clusters. All right, so um, I have this p-value. Um, it controls the selective type one error rate um, and I have claimed that I know how to compute it. I mean, I've gone through um, several slides of effort to get to this point. So it would be probably a bit embarrassing if I didn't know how to compute it. So now let's talk about how we would actually do that. Again, our p-value, it's a conditional probability of this random variable phi being larger than this threshold. It turns out that we can rewrite this as one minus the CDF of some random variable that is proportional to a chi distribution that has also been truncated to a particular set, which I'm calling S. And the set S, what is it? Well, it's the set of phi's where if you construct an X prime of phi and you cluster it, it'll result in CIK and CIK prime. So assuming that I have this set S on hand, um, I should just be able to compute my p-value in like one line in R, right? Because you can basically just like write this as the ratio of chi probabilities. So the million dollar question is, um, how am I supposed to get the set S? And as it turns out, um, computing the set S is kind of like the hard part. Um, so starting now, that's what I'm going to talk about. And um, it's worth noting that up to this point in this talk, everything really could have been applied with any type of clustering algorithm. Um, I think I have some plots with hierarchical clustering, but I haven't said anything really specific to hierarchical clustering rather than something like k-means or maybe like model-based clustering. 
But in order to think about calculating the set S, that's when we really need to get into the details of how a particular clustering algorithm works. So all of that to say that starting now, all of the results are going to be for various types of hierarchical clustering with squared Euclidean distance. Um, I'm gonna just start with like a quick refresher for those who are maybe like a little bit less familiar with hierarchical clustering. Um, it's basically like an algorithm that produces like a sequence of clustering um, in the following steps. Um, so the first thing you do is you put every observation in its own cluster. And then you go ahead and you pick the two clusters that are most similar. Um, you need to define what you mean by most similar. So for example, you could have it be the smallest square you put in distance. And you're gonna go ahead and merge those two most similar clusters into one cluster. Once we've done that merge, um, we have a new set of clusters. And the next step is really just to repeat that process. So again, we want to find the two most similar clusters and merge them. But there's kind of like a new small snag here, which is that we need to define similarity between sets of observations um, instead of just like a single pair of observations. And there are basically various things called linkage criterion that do just that. So once we've selected a linkage, once again, we pick out the most similar pair of clusters. And again, we're merging them. And we're basically, we just repeat the process until we've glommed everything into one big cluster. And you can see we've like sort of like visualized these clusters in like the form of a tree. We can basically just get different clusterings from this tree by cutting it horizontally at different heights and kind of seeing what stays together or falls apart. All right, so um, now that hopefully we're up to speed on higher clustering, um, let's like keep our eyes on the goal here. We want to compute the set S. So at least one, so like one complication um, in wanting to do this for hierarchical clustering is, um, well, when I started thinking about it, well, in principle, I realized you could get the same cluster C at K and C at K prime by cutting different hierarchical clustering trees. So um, for example, you could imagine running hierarchical clustering on your original data set and get something like this, um, where you're cutting at the dashed line and that gets you a green and purple cluster. Um, but then you could conceivably think about like, you know, running hierarchical clustering on like a perturbed data set and then getting something like this where you're cutting at this dashed line, um, you get two clusters and these groupings are actually exactly the same as the original data on the left. Um, one, two, and four are in one cluster and three and five are in another cluster. But if you look at it very closely, the two trees are actually different, right? On the right, you have um, observations two and four merging first. But on the left, observations one and four have merged first. And in principle, you would think that we have to account for this somehow, which um, just thinking about it, it sort of makes my head hurts because it involves a bunch of different permutations to think about. Well, the good news is um, we have a very useful result that basically says we don't have to worry about that. So like in a nutshell, it's what's written in, at the top of the slide. Um, basically, there's one way and one way only to get C at K and C at K prime by clustering a perturbed data set of the form X prime of phi. And that's why having the trees um, built on X and X prime of phi be literally exactly the same all the way up into the merge that created C at K and C at K prime. So basically what this means is that hypothetical situation, I had like pictures four on the last slide, where you're really getting the same clusters um, from different trees. I can just like guarantee you that that can't happen. So this is really nice because it means that I can rewrite the set S as the intersection over the first N minus K merges in the dendrogram um, of the set of fees such that the same pair of merging of clusters are like merging at the else step of the hierarchical clustering algorithm in both X prime of phi and X. And roughly speaking, this is just like because the only way for these two dendrograms to be the same up until the n minus kth merge is for the first merge to be the same, the second merge to be the same, and like so on and so forth, all the way up until n minus k. And we can even take this like insight a little bit further uh, using some, by like thinking very hard about how hierarchical clustering really makes merges. And it turns out that we can actually rewrite the set 
S even more. We can rewrite it as an intersection over every pair of clusters that could have theoretically merged um, in the hierarchical clustering algorithm, but didn't actually merge in the first N minus K steps. And this is an intersection over um, on the order of n squared set, sets where n is the number of observations. And what are the sets that we're intersecting? Well, they're the set of phi where the dissimilarity between a and b and x prime of phi is larger than the maximum height at which any pair of clusters merge during the time that a and b actually exist, still exist in the dendrogram based on x. So um, what's on the right-hand side of this inequality is a little bit more difficult to process, but the key takeaway I want to point out about these sets is it turns out that for a whole bunch of commonly used linkages, these purple sets um, actually turn out to be, have like an incredibly simple structure. Um, these purple sets turn out to just be the solution sets to quadratic inequalities. So in other words, you can calculate each of these n squared intersected sets by like solving a quadratic equation using the quadratic formula, which can be done in constant time. So that means that we can actually calculate the set S in n squared time for these four linkages, which if you think about it is pretty incredible because that's basically the runtime of like the fastest hierarchical clustering algorithm I know of. And it actually will turn out um, through a I won't go over here, but through a different, but actually somewhat simpler argument even, you can also show that you can compute this set S in quadratic time for a single linkage as well, which is like another one of those linkages that tends to appear on everyone's like most commonly used list. All right, so just to take a moment to review, we want to test the null hypothesis of no difference in means between two estimated clusters CIK and CIK prime. We're doing this by calculating this p value um, that basically like is, it uses the CDF of a truncated and scaled chi distribution. Basically, because this involves truncation, um, in order to be able to calculate this in one line in R, we need to be able to compute the truncation set S. The good news is we can do that in quadratic time for average centroid, median, um, ward, and single linkage. And now those of you in the metaphorical room that are more familiar with hierarchical clustering are maybe wondering like, wait, um, what about complete linkage? Because that's kind of like the last type of commonly used linkage that I haven't mentioned. Um, and unfortunately it is missing from this list for a good reason. Um, I don't know how to compute this set S for complete linkage in, in, in like a computationally efficient manner. Um, I, I do really wish I did, but I don't. But the silver lining is what we were able to come up with is a way to basically just like approximate this p-value um, using um, Monte Carlo sampling. Um, in particular, it's like an important sampling algorithm. So basically, even though we can't analytically calculate a p-value for complete linkage hierarchical clustering in like quadratic time or anything like that, what I can do is that I can approximate it at least like reasonably efficiently. And what's more, um, if you're not a fan of hierarchical clustering, that's okay. It turns out that you can actually use this approximation more generally for any clustering algorithm. And in fact, you can do this very easily using our R package. Um, I'll come back to that at the very end. All right, so before I do real data, I'm just gonna sh quickly show you what happens with simulated data. Um, so I simulated data here, um, I'm calling it the global null because there's no clusters, um, which means that there really is no true difference in population means between any kind of groupings that you could have possibly made out of these observations. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and we're going to cluster these global null data sets. And then um, we're going to pick a random pair of clusters and then we're going to test the null hypothesis of no difference in means between them. And we're going to consider four linkages, um, average, centroid, um, single, and complete. Um, for the ones where we can calculate the p-value exactly, of course, I'm going to do that. Um, for the one that I can't, complete linkage, I'm going to use that approximation that I talked about. Um, so here are the results in each of these panels. Um, you can see I have a different type of linkage. 
I have a bunch of different colored lines, so perhaps it's a little hard to see. Um, these different colored lines correspond to different parameters in our simulation setup. Um, but as you can see, um, it's actually even kind of hard to see that there are different colors because across the board, the p values are all very perfectly in sync with this 45 degree line. So that's good. It means my test really is producing uniformly distributed p values now. And this is basically a consequence of the fact that I designed my test to control the selective type 1 error rate. And these results are good because it means that we're not rejecting more often than the nominal rate under this global null scenario. So now we've established that our test is doing the right thing when there are no clusters. Well, you might wonder now, what about if there are actual clusters? So to find out, um, I'm simulating data sets that have like 30 observations and three clusters that are equally sized. Um, and they, each of these three clusters have means that are like, they have the same distance from each other. So kind of just like this picture that I have in 2D, but like think about it with like 10 features instead of two. And we're gonna look at two things. The first thing is conditional power. So um, this is the, I'm defining this as the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, given that the two clusters that we got from the data actually are true clusters in the data generating mechanism. And also we're going to look at the detection probability. So this is like the probability of having estimated two clusters from the data that actually are true clusters. So in these plots, um, the x-axis is the distance between the true means of the three clusters. Um, the y-axis on the left is conditional power. The y-axis on the right is detection probability. Um, I have four different colors representing four different linkages here. And you can kind of just see from this plot, the first thing you might notice is that like, um, as the distance between the true clusters increase, the cond conditional power and the detection probability are both increasing. I think it's probably not surprising if their clusters are more separated, then it makes sense that we have better power and also makes sense that we have better, we would do a better job of figuring out that those actually are clusters. But another interesting thing here is you can kind of see by looking at the plot that not all linkages are really created equal here. Um, single linkage um, has terrible detection probability compared to the other linkages. Has noticeably worse conditional power than the other methods either. Um, average linkage and complete linkage, they do the best in terms of both detection probability and conditional power. We're seeing that centered linkage is performing sort of in between. All right, um, now that we're hopefully satisfied, our test does the right thing in simulated data. Um, now I think it's for the real test, like what does it do on real data? So I'm starting with a really simple data set so that we can get our bearings. Um, this is the Palmer penguins data set, which is data on three species of penguins. As you can see from these amazing illustrations by Alison Horst, you can actually sort of visually distinguish between them using their bill length and flipper lengths. So for this analysis, I'm just going to subset to the 165 female penguins that have complete data on what species they are, their, the length of their bills, and the length of their flippers. So um, I've plotted the bill lengths and the flipper lengths of these penguins. Um, the different shapes for separate out into three groups. But I'm going to apply average linkage hierarchical clustering to this data. Um, and after looking at the dendrogram, I choose to pick six clusters and I get these six clusters that are displayed with colors. So let's first zoom in on this orange and green estimated cluster. You can see the hierarchical clustering sort of messed up. Most of the circled observations are Adelie penguins. Um, so we wouldn't really expect a true difference in means between orange and green. So we run some tests to find out. We'll apply the naive um, wall test as well as our test. And you can see that um, in this case, naively applying the wall test gives us this tiny p-value while our p-value is much larger. Again, both these clusters are Adley penguins. There probably isn't a true difference in means. Our test results make much more sense. Now let's zoom in on green and pink. Again, we run these tests. We get these tiny p-values from both the wall test and our test. Well, it turns out that the pink cluster contains Gen 2 penguins and the green clusters contain Adley penguins. So I think this is a good result again. We expect there to be true difference in means between species, and you can see that our test is making that correct call. Okay, now I want to finally get to that single cell application that I promised at the end of the talk. Um, I won't try to explain this in too much detail. Um, often there are people in the audience who know more about the biology. 
cell cell. Ideally, we would like to compare the gene expression profiles of cell types, but it's either impossible or impractical to actually get those labels. Instead, we're going to cluster them to get things which we hope are cell subtypes, and then we'll compare the gene expression of the resulting clusters. We're working from data um, from the 2017 paper. Um, and the interesting part about this data is that we know that it contains various cell types. We also, for once, have labels that are not directly derived from the gene expression measurements. That means that I can like subsample 600 T cells. I can sort of call this a no clusters data set because I think they're all T cells, so there shouldn't be true clusters. I can also sam sample like 200 each of three types. Again, I'm calling this clusters. Um, I'm modifying the test to assume like that the covariance matrix is not diagonal because that's not very realistic. Um, and I estimate it using a high dimensional covariance matrix estimation method published a few years ago. All right, so the first thing I did is I clustered like the no clusters data set containing only one cell type. I applied ward link for clustering to get three clusters. What you can see here is like the first two principal components of the data colored according to those three estimated clusters. You kind of see that the naive test for a difference means that isn't accounting for the fact that we didn't pre-specify these groups. You're getting these really small p-values, like less than 0.01. Ours are much larger. So our test results are conforming, again, to what we actually know about these data. These are all one cell type. There probably isn't a difference in means between them. By contrast, I can do the same thing to like these so-called clusters data with a mix of three cell types. Again, just for visualizations, the first two PCs. Um, I color them by the estimated cluster assignments. Turns out they're pretty much the same as the true ones. And you can see that both the naive p-values and our p-values are both pretty small, around 0.01. So once again, our test seems to be making the right call here. And now um, I think I'm getting close, I'm very good, getting very close to time. So I just wanna wrap up. If there's anything that I want you to take away, unless you're very uncareful, double dipping will often end up rejecting way more often than should. Given this reality, we, we have choices to make as statisticians, right? One helpful thing we can do, and actually we do do, is tell our collaborators and our students and such to not double dip, which apparently is the moral of the Seinfeld episode. But that's not always a practical solution because our collaborators are good scientists, right? They're not double dipping because they like rebelling against statistical rules or anything. If they're double dipping, it's because it seems like the most practical way to answer the scientific question of interest. So in this talk, I've taken what is, I think is that a, an equally important and complementary approach. So basically, instead of telling people not to double dip, we, we're coming up with a way to safely double dip, at least in the context of this problem for testing for a difference in means after clustering. Full glory details are in the paper. It's under a second round of review at Jazz Theory and Methods. And like I mentioned earlier, we have software. Um, it's called Cluster PVAL. It's out on GitHub. Um, I did work pretty hard to document and clean my code and to like make a nice website with hopefully user-friendly user instructions. Um, you can find it probably at this point, you can just Google for it or you can find it from my website. I would love for you to check it out or recommend it to any of your collaborators. And finally, quick thank you to my collaborators on my work on this work. Um, this is my advisor, Daniela Witten um, at UW Seattle, and my longtime collaborator, Jacob Bien, at your institution in a different department, data sciences and operations. They've both been great to work with. And thank you very much for your attention. I would love to take some questions at this point. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Is there anyone attending who would like to ask a question? So Lucy, this is a really nice talk, uh, very clear. And I was just kind of wondering um, if you had other applications that you've seen this kind of uh, procedure being applied to beyond single cell data? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I think probably the most prominent place where it's being applied truly routinely, like you see it in like pretty much every single cell paper. Um, but I did like a tweet thread about this work on Twitter and like it was crazy how many people were coming out of the woodwork from like every discipline like that I could think of like psychology, neuroscience, medicine, you know, where they were going like, oh God, this is wrong, but we do this all the time. <laughs> um, and I think in, especially in like business applications, I think this is probably not so well known as a bad thing to do in like business analytics. Um, but I also, but I think it feels like a natural thing that you do and people are probably doing it. 
it can be hard to get people to admit that they're doing it though too, at, especially at this stage in the talk where I've just told you for 15 minutes how, how wrong it is. Yes. <laughs> Is there any, I had, wasn't able to um, think through, but is there any difference with the high dimensionality of the single cell data that um, affects how you go about it? Or does it not matter how many, how many features are part of your driving your clusters? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the theoretical framework doesn't really, doesn't, isn't, in theory, it isn't super affected by the dimensionality. In practice, like it definitely changes things. One thing is that, like you know, I assume that the covariance matrix is known, but like of course, in practice, I'm not never going to know it. I'm going to have to estimate it. That gets much harder in the high dimensional setting than in the in the low dimensional setting, for sure. So that's like one pain point in high dimensions. Um, another pain point, actually, I guess that's probably the main pain point because this one is a little bit smaller. Um, I talked about like the runtime scaling in terms of like the number of samples, but um, the number of features does affect the computational runtime as well. Um, you can think about this just like for hierarchical clustering when you compute like the distance metric, if you're using squared Euclidean distance, you have to sum over each dimension. So um, you can kind of just see from that, that like the, if I had actually presented the results, including like the computation time results, including like features, it would, it would also scale like multiplicatively with the number of features. Um, quick question on, on the subject of runtime. You, you, noticed, yeah. you noted that for the complete linkage case, you have to employ an important sampler. And important yeah. samplers are not famous for being computationally efficient. So I just wondered <laughs> oh, what yeah. effect that might have on the runtime. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's slow. Like, because basically what the, the procedure um, is like you sample from some distribution because it's important sampling. It's not the null distribution, but whatever you're sampling a data set. And then like you have to cluster, run the clustering algorithm. You have to check if the original clusters that you got appear in those estimated clusters. Um, and depending on yes, no, uh, you also check if the difference in means is, is larger than what you observed. And you either put a tick in the numerator or the tick in the denominator. But like you have to do this a bunch of times in order to get a good approximation. So basically it scales in terms of like the amount of time that it takes to run a hierarchical clustering algorithm once um, times the number of, of like samples you're going to take, which as you can imagine, if that's large, even though it's theoretically, I guess, technically quadratic time in practice is way slower. Um, I even had like a student I'm working with complain to me about it <laughs> using my package um, the other day. <laughs> um, so yeah, for sure it's slower. Um, but uh, there is one silver lining, with, which is at least it's paralyzable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have two examples. Uh, the second example seem to be better separated, the clusters, are, but the p-values are not as significant as the first one. Why is that? Um, well, I suppose, I feel like it's hard to tell really if the, the clusters are, um, wait, sorry. Um, I thought, where the, okay, I think I'm trying to, well, the naive, naive P, I, uh, let me see, the naive p-values are very different from each other, right? Right. Between the two examples. Right, so yeah, I, I remember guess. the first example, your p-value is very small. The second is not that small, um, but the second, at least based on your slides, the the clusters seem to be better separated. Right, that's a good point. It's um, I always find it a little bit difficult to really assess like whether things like be really sure whether things are more or less se separated in high dimensions. I mean, I know I put up the first two PCs, but like it's possible for those to not be an accurate visual visualization of the data. Um, I would say that probably it has something to do with here. Um, so the funny thing about our test is like compared to um, like thinking about power for like a traditional t test is that like you have an extra thing that can affect the power that doesn't appear for a t test, and that's the size of the conditioning set, which basically like you can imagine like it's basically like if you can wiggle your data a lot and still get the same clusters then the conditioning set is going to be big and you lose less power and you lose less information by conditioning. But if you can only wiggle your data like a little bit um, and 
you um, with, and if you can only data, wiggle your data a little bit um, without changing the clusters, um, then you're going to have a smaller conditioning set and you have less power. So I'm going to guess that um, somehow in this case, like in the single cell example, the conditioning set is just smaller. Um, and that leads to perhaps a little bit less power. But at least, you know, like the, the I, I was reassured by the fact that the p values from our test were actually quite similar to the p values from like the naive approach that doesn't even control the type one error rate, right? So it seems to suggest that, like, I mean, again, like it's hard. It's, it doesn't seem fair to make a head-to-head -head comparison for these because the naive one doesn't even control the type one error, but it seems like we're, we're doing okay-ish when it comes to power. Yeah, you're certainly not conditioning away all your signals somehow. Um, I was right. impressed by that too, that it seems like you're getting roughly the same p-values um, in the case where something's going on, so. Right, right. Well, in the extreme, when the conditioning set is like the whole real is like the whole real line, then you're like it's basically the same as not conditioning. Yeah. I have another question. So in, in practice, people often use Jacquard score to help them evaluate how reliable a cluster is. So how is the Jacquard score uh, compared with yours? Certainly yours is the p-value, Jacquard score is just a score. Sorry, I somehow didn't catch that. The what score? Jacquard. Jacquard, oh, like Jacquard, like Jacquard similarity. Um, kind of, yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm not familiar with that particular one. Is it like similar to something like the, the Rand index? Um, I feel like compared to like the Rand index, like if you're thinking about the Rand index, you have to have some gold standard to compare to um, and you wouldn't have to have one in this case. Um, if it's a measure of, um, if, it's me if, if it's more like a measure of like separation between clusters, um, I think it's related to what we're doing here because like the, the separation of the clusters kind of like determines the power of our test. So it's like sort of a way of formalizing that intuition that better separated clusters might be, might be more real, but like in a way that actually has a probabilistic interpretation, which I think is an advantage. Thank you. Nice. Are there any last questions? It brings us to the hour, but I want to give everyone a chance to ask our speaker a question if you have one. Well, hearing none, I guess thank you.